Hey friends, Catherine here from Research Rockstar and today I'd like to talk about big data. I was recently uh, had the opportunity to be the moderator on a panel at a trade show and on the panel I had four people, wonderful professionals and two of them were from what we might consider more market research, consumer insights kinds of roles, and two are more from what you might consider predictive analytics or big data types of roles. And in the panel discussion, we were talking about things that relate to how various types of data sources are coming together and how various types of expertise play in today's organization. So big brands, big companies that are customer driven and data driven and how all of these different areas of expertise come to play. But it was pretty evident to me that at least one of our experts was highly biased. One of our big data experts, a wonderful professional with great areas of expertise, but he made a few statements during the talk that made it clear that big data is, in his opinion, the best source of data and that it is, quote, winning over market research and consumer insights. And this was really something that I found on one hand a little bit amusing because he was so obviously biased, but it's something that really is a challenge. And I think it can be really hard when we're working in a profession where there are different experts, but so many of the experts are clearly biased towards the sources of data and methodologies with which they happen to have personal expertise. So everybody has sources of bias. However, I'd like to think that those of us who are in data professions are a little bit more vigilant about understanding and trying to mitigate the risk of our own biases. Apparently that's not the case. So I just want to set the record straight. There is no perfect data source, including big data. There is a myth that is sometimes propagated by people who are biased towards big data as the data source and way of approaching analysis for organizations that big data is all kittens and rainbows. And it can be easy to be swayed or to think, well, gosh, this person's an expert and I'm not an expert in big data, so maybe they're right. Maybe it is all kittens and rainbows. But trust me, take just a few minutes of your own time and check out articles in wonderful publications like Information Week, CIO Magazine, Forbes, and others. And you will find numerous articles on big data failures. And you'll even see articles that talk about things why, about, for example, why most big data projects fail. That's right. There are a lot of documented cases of big data projects failing. In addition, there have been numerous surveys of CIOs and presidents of companies and CEOs and other C-suite executives about the enormous pain they have in trying to get big data projects to be consistently productive for them. Um, and of course, there have over the years been a number of well-publicized failures. Now, some of those well-publicized failures were from a few years ago, so I'm not going to rehash the old Target story or the old Instagram story, but just even recently in 2018, there was a very well-publicized story from Fitbit and Strava, which is the software company that collects and stores fitness data that's collected from Fitbit. So people who use Fitbits while they're exercising, they're basically opting to have their data collected. And that data includes your exercise activities, including where you are exercising. Unfortunately, what came out just recently was that there are a lot of military personnel who enjoy exercising with a Fitbit. And their data, of course, was being captured as well. In this case, Strava makes some of this data publicly available. And what happened was that some casual observers of this data realized that there were some patterns of activity where they were seeing a lot of people exercising near military locations. And it turned out that it wasn't too hard to extrapolate, even just from a casual observation, that these patterns of where the exercise was taking place was actually revealing the location of military personnel in areas of conflict. So it was revealing secret locations where American personnel are actually stationed that had not been previously made public. So this is a huge issue. So in this case, a large data set, big data being made public actually created a security issue. Now, not all organizations that are doing big data projects make that data public, or at least not intentionally. 
clearly we've had some high profile security breaches as well. But it does point to the fact that there are challenges. No data source is perfect. Whether or not you intend to make your data public is another issue, but clearly there can be unforeseen implications of having very large data sets. And so there are a lot of reasons why big data can be problematic. It is not all kittens and rainbows. There have been numerous surveys done by organizations such as Ernst & Young, Gartner Group, SyncSort, and others that also have shared how top executives have concerns about big data. Yes, they're investing in it. Yes, we're hoping it works out. It can be a fantastic source, and there certainly have been many successes as well. But it's not always easy, and it's certainly not always successful. In fact, in a Gartner study from 2016, they concluded that only 15% of big data projects actually make it to completion. Think about what that means. That means that 85% of projects are started. Some amount of staff time, some amount of tool investment, some amount of C-suite bandwidth is spent planning and starting these projects, and yet the projects end up not making it to completion. So clearly a lot of out-of-pocket expenses and the time of very important people are getting wasted if 85% of the projects are actually not making it to completion. So that's a challenge. Again, another challenge that's widely cited has to do with data quality. Indeed, from a SyncSort survey from December of 2017, 40% of executives reported that data quality is a significant challenge to their big data success. So clearly there are a lot of different challenges here. In fact, when I just perused some of these articles, again, from like Information Week and tmforum.org and forbes.com, I saw some recurring themes. So these are the recurring themes that I'm consolidating from various experts. Seven reasons why big data projects do fail. One has to do with lack of skilled team members. You know, this type of data analysis and data management is still fairly new. It's not like there are people who've been doing this for 20 years. This is all still fairly new. The types of tools that are now commonly being used for both um, you know, managing data and analyzing it, a lot of the tools that are being used today have been available for five years or less. So it's not like there are people with tons and tons of experience with these tools. Another thing that is widely cited is poor executive level direction. That is executives who give vague mandates or don't give adequate enough uh, clarity in what they're trying to accomplish. That is, the executives need to be able to tell the big data project leads what their criteria for success is going to be for any big data project. And there's still a learning curve here, so it's not surprising, and I'm sure this is going to get improved over time, but right now this is a challenge to the success of these types of investments. Another issue that commonly comes up is that there's a focus on technology not outcomes. That is, people kind of fall in love with cool new tools or ideas that they're hearing, but not really thinking first about what their needs are. You know, not taking that step back to think strategically, what is the business trying to accomplish, and then finding the right tools and methods. Sometimes a very effective sales pitch can come in, feel very uh, convincing, and can derail what really should be a more strategically driven in investment. Another common issue that comes up quite a lot is poor data quality. Several articles that I read talked about issues where the results from certain big data projects were not uh, replicable and where they actually had studies or projects that ended up having results that were extremely muddy and therefore decision makers weren't comfortable using the results from that particular project. There's a lot of challenges also with bringing in data from multiple data sources. And those of us who work in market research and consumer insights know this as well, because this is true for us as well. You know, sometimes we need to consolidate data from multiple surveys into one data set, and we know how challenging that is. So it's pretty easy to imagine that if you're, in fact, now integrating data from multiple silos that could include things like data from your e-commerce system and from web analytics data and from social data, et cetera, all of these previously siloed data sets, clearly bringing them in together into one data set is going to be challenging. We also see a lot of articles that talk about the fact that many projects are planned but never completed. I gave you a data point on that just a minute ago. And here's the one that concerns me the most. Biased advisors overpromise and underdeliver. 
And this is why when I was on this panel, it really struck me that here I've got somebody on the panel who's clearly very smart, clearly an expert on big data and various types of data analytics, but he was very biased. He was very biased that his way of looking at data analysis was the best way. And that concerns me, right, because there is no perfect data source. Big data has a lot of potential benefits, and many organizations are reaping positive return on investment from these initiatives. But there are clearly a lot of challenges still. So what does that all mean? You know, what does that mean for an organization? What's the answer? If the people who are advising me on how to improve my business and how to be data driven and customer centric, if they're biased towards big data to the point where maybe my expectations aren't being realistically set or maybe I am being over promised and under delivered to, what's the answer? Well, I think that this is an issue all over. Any kind of data related function this is an issue for. I think we have to be really careful that who we trust to advise us aren't overselling and under delivering. We have to be aware of sales pitches from biased sources. People who only do big data tend to be biased towards big data. And by the way, this applies as well to market research and insights. One of the things that comes up a lot from people who are in market research and insights when we talk about the role of market research data versus big data is, well, market research people will be quick to say, well, maybe big data gives you a lot of behavioral data, but it doesn't tell you why. It doesn't tell you why people behave a certain way. That's true. It doesn't. But there's a bias in that as well, because the brutal reality is sometimes why doesn't matter. Sometimes the business decision that needs to be made, the strategy that needs to be informed, simply needs behavioral data. Certainly as somebody who likes to understand customer behavior and consumer attitudes, I like to understand why, but there are cases where that's a nice to know and not a must have. So clearly both people who are coming from the big data side of it are biased towards their methods and approaches, but so are people who are coming from a more market research and consumer insights side of things. They have their biases too. And so I think one of the challenges for business executives these days is they have to really assess who is advising them and understand whether or not these people are biased. I think that one of the things that can be really helpful these days is to have advisors who are comfortable with multiple sources of data and multiple methodologies. And an easy way to sort of test people is to ask them, hey, given this particular problem I'm having, or given this decision I'd like to make, what would your approach be? And if they only come back with one approach, that's a pretty big red flag that they're biased because they should always have at least two options. I've yet to see a business strategy issue or a business decision that could not be informed by at least two different methods or data sources. So if your advisor is always coming back to you with one option, Oh, and it happens to be the option with which they happen to personally be an expert in, that's a pretty big red flag. So one of the challenges I think for business executives is to make sure that they can assess, am I getting advice from somebody who's truly data agnostic or am I getting advice from somebody who's biased towards their particular specialty? And it's not an easy thing, but it is a skill set that I truly believe all business professionals can develop with a little bit of effort. If this is a topic that's of interest to you, I just want to share with you that we do have a course coming up on data fluency. This is actually a course we teach a couple of times a year at Research Rockstar called Data Fluency for Marketers. And the purpose of this course is to give people who may not even have a background in data analysis of any kind enough of an understanding of data analysis and different types of data sources so that they can understand when they might want to use different types of data to address different types of business challenges so that they can be informed, they can be a data fluent, uh, smart consumer of different types of data. So there's some information here uh, on the Research Rockstar website, training.researchrockstar.com, on our course Data Fluency for Marketers. The next date is going to be in June of 2018, but we do offer that course a couple of times a year. I hope this conversation is helpful and I look forward to any comments. If you did enjoy this conversation, please do subscribe and like us. Thanks so much and have a great day.